Shut up and sit down. And that's another thing I've thought about while I've been out here. I think we use too many health and beauty care products. You know what I've used since I've been out here? Sand and water. And it has been sufficient. Just basic. Good old-fashioned basic. I think that's where that's where we're failing at. Just basic, down-to-earth skills. We're the only creature in nature that cannot survive apart from all this artificiality that we have. Technology's good. There's benefits to it, but there's a dark side. Something's wrong when you go through your whole day looking at a screen and pushing a button. I'm just saying balance, I guess is what I'm trying to say. In all things balance. We're going to have to slow down, think, get back to being real people, listening to each other. I think if we focused on what we had in common instead of what we had that differs, then a lot of things will be different. That's one thing, you know, with coming out into the woods, one thing you realize, there is no hierarchy or pecking order or social status. There are so many commonalities. Air. We all breathe it. I don't care if you're a billionaire or a homeless vagrant. You got to have it. And the same air he breathes is the same air that I breathe. So we have that in common. And the same with water. See, I'm a person that I think like Henry David Thoreau. I actually read Thoreau. I like him. I would have liked to hang out with him. He, he was probably a really cool guy. And here am I, just a speck of dust. Abiding his time and patience. Until such time as I don't want to do that anymore. Welcome to Sarge Approved. I am Sarge, and I'm here with Frenzy. Hey, Frenzy. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Super good. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Oh. And uh, we have our guest this evening is Mr. Alan Kay. How's it going, Alan? Greetings. Hey, Greetings. Alan. Salutations. Hello, hello. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, we're pretty excited to have you on tonight. Obviously, good to uh, be here. we're both fans. And um, you are, for those of you, for those out there listening who don't know who Alan Kay is, um, he's a, can we, do we, do you like to be referred to as a survival expert or a survivalist or outdoors? I absolutely, <laughs> I hate the term expert. I know. Yeah, the, you know, when, when people call me an expert, I, I usually think of, uh, if you break that word down, you've got X and you've got spurt. And an X is something that used to be a former, and a spurt is a sudden burst of energy with no staying power. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's really not any room for Xs or spurts or experts in life, especially not in survival. I'm just more of an avid camper, you know. Uh, every day of your life is school, and you never graduate. So you got to be a lifelong student. I think mm-hmm. I think you, I think you're minimalizing it a little bit by referring to it as just an avid camper. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a hobby. Yeah, that's my hobby. <laughs> a really, really, really good avid camper. There you go. Damn, it's a hardcore camper. <laughs> that's about as hardcore as it gets. As if you referring to yourself as a camper. Kind of a minimalist. Type of camping, you know. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, Alan is an avid camper, and he used his avid camper skills to be the season one winner of the History Channel show Alone, where they stranded ten of you guys on an island for uh, well as long as you could last. Yeah, that was the idea. To uh, you know, it, it was kind of a competition, but I never really viewed it that way and and i think that's true for the other guys as well they never really felt like it was a competition as far as us competing against each other the 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 competition was basically you against yourself you know yeah you and the elements 
Yeah, I mean, we tend to, you, you hear it framed like that sometimes, where they say, uh, man versus nature, mm-hmm. you know, in this epic struggle to survive. But really, if you go into it with that mentality that it's you against nature, you know, it's it's not going to work out. Uh, yeah. You have to you have to find your place and whatever the rhythms are and whatever biosphere you get dropped in and kind of, you know, figure out where your place is in there and how you're going to ebb and flow with that. Yeah, so you kind of looked at it more as like you just kind of were philosophically dealing with it more within yourself versus anything else that was coming at you. Yeah, you know, I think in modern times we have a tendency to look through the lens of separation, like, you know, that the natural world is something uh, foreign to us when, in fact, that is your natural habitat. You're designed to live there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we have actually, mankind has devolved. When you think about it, uh, you know, a couple generations ago, we could sustain our existence in our given environment, and, and in modern times, largely we cannot. Your average person cannot go out there on the land and sustain their own life, their own existence, uh, let alone, you know, just their life, not to, to mention their families and other people around them to sustain multiple lives. You know, we just don't have the patterns of life that are conducive to that in modern times. We're, we've got our monetary systems. We have our technologically advanced systems that we lean on, and, you know, we've kind of gotten away from some of those real real basic things. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I agree that, um, like, society as a whole has basically devolved, you know, with where we're sitting right now. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's a lot of people out there who don't even know how to change a damn tire and let alone survive in the wilderness if they needed to. But it's also, I mean... What, what do you think the answer is? I mean, because you, you want to get to a point where, you know, your technology and your innovations and everything can get you to some level of comfort, right? Isn't that kind of the ultimate goal to not have to, you know, rely on surviving in the woods? Oh, sure. I mean, I don't expect everybody to run back uh, to the wilderness and put on the buckskin loincloth and <laughs> do all of that thing. <laughs> but I think we have to keep in touch with, with what it means to be a fully functioning human on the earth. You know, we have to mm-hmm. maintain our resilience so that when these systems do break down, and they do, we see it all the time on the news, uh, you know, power outages, uh, snowstorms, and so forth, you, you need a backup plan. Yep. And uh, I think it's good to stay connected to that, even if that's not our, our primary life pattern, you know, to retain and pass those skills on so that they – don't become lost. Yeah. Right. I, well, I also think that it makes you, if everyone did, if more people did that, like made a conscious effort to do that, you would definitely appreciate the th- other things that you have that are the technological things or the things that make your life easier too. Yeah. I, be, I don't know. It's a good balance, you know, to be able to, I mean, yeah, I like being able to watch Netflix sit on the couch and watch Netflix, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's awesome to be able to have that in our generation. But I also agree that, that everyone should know how to take care of themselves when shit hits the fan. And I mean, at least to some level. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, we hear a lot of conversations around this big, massive apocalyptic zombified, (laughs) whatever type event. And, you know, more, more commonly, it's going to be just day to day life happening and then all of a sudden, uh, you you have this issue. You know, if you recall in Atlanta, maybe three years ago, they they had a little bit of snow and people slept in their cars for four days. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, they weren't they weren't planning on it, and it wasn't this big zombie apocalypse. But you know, hypothermia was on the menu, and it was a real problem. Yeah. Uh, and then we had Superstorm Sandy uh, in the Northeast. That was an issue. Uh, recently, uh, Oregon. You know, they got an unprecedented blanket of snow around a foot of snow which is uncommon for portland area and and it caused some issues so i mean it could just be something as simple as a weather event it could be a car accident um you know we we do things that we train and we have these visions in our mind that it's going to be some romantic Mm -hmm. um type of thing like we see on tv arnold schwarzenegger doing some stuff but, in fact, most of the time it's it's less dramatic than that. You know, one of the first airway issues I ever treated 
after having some medical training, usually in a tactical type of environment, was on a three-year-old daughter of mine who decided she was going to stuff a little plastic bead into her nose. And oh. so, you know, that it's, it's the less uh, romantic stuff like that. And, you know, I carry around a med kit, and I've got SAM splints and tourniquets and all this stuff in it. And the first time I used my SAM splint was on a, a tib-fib spiral fracture in a Chuck E. Cheese on my son, and he was four years old at the time, so I oh improvise a cast. He got injured on a slide before we went there on a playground. So, I mean, it's stuff like that. It's just day-to-day. -day. But, you know, I was the guy in there that had a Sam splint and knew how to use it. So uh, it's just funny. preparation meets opportunity. You never know when you're going to be the first responder. And, you know, I've come upon car wrecks before, and everybody's looking around, what do we do, you know, and I show up, and I've got – I've got the know-how of what to do and and the materials to carry that out. So, you know, a little preparation goes a long way. Yeah. Well, so uh, for those who don't know, a SAM splint is kind of like, it's like a, basically it's like a rubbery kind of splint that you, you can use to support, you know, like you said, a broken bone, but it's kind of made of foam too and rubber so you can roll it up like tape. Is that kind of what a SAM splint, would that describe that? That's a pretty good description. It's, it's basically a way that you can immobilize a suspected fracture until you can get some definitive care, you know, so that you don't do further damage. Yeah, and you could just, like, keep it, like you said, in your little kit, like roll it up and it's just there. Yeah, they're super lightweight, and, uh, you know, they don't take up uh, much room. And, yeah, and they're, cool. they're, really, they're really pliable. You know, you can even make it into a seat collar for, like, a neck injury, or you can immobilize pretty much any part of the body with it. Cool. See, you got to be prepared all the time, even at Chuck E. Cheese. You got to be prepared. Well, you do, and and that's my motto: if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. You know, yeah. you, you, nobody gives you the memo and says, "Hey, on Thursday, you know, it's, it's going down." Yeah. So be wired tight and ready for flight and all that. You need to operate that way every day of your life. You know, um, we have basic needs as human beings walking around on the planet Earth. You've got to have water. You've got to have shelter. You have to have fire, and you have to have food. And so knowing that, you should just go ahead and build that into your patterns of life so that every day I'm ready for that if something happens. You know, there, there's no reason to die from hypothermia. All it takes is a little forethought, a little preparation. You know, carry on your person a reliable means of, of fire. Uh, dress appropriately. You know, we always think about shelter. We think more of a structure, but your clothing is your first line of your shelter. And if you dress appropriately... You know, and maybe stuff a Mylar blanket in your pocket. That'll go a long way to keeping you alive. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Layers, layers, layers. Am I right? Yeah, redundancy. You, you have to build redundancy into everything you do. You know, you need your primary plan, a secondary plan, and then a tertiary plan. And sometimes it takes cumulative effects of many different things to, to facilitate your survival. So what, what got you started in all this? What, what got you started in this whole survivalist I, I, did, I just didn't have a hobby, and <laughs> I just hung out in the woods a lot. How young? You know, when, when did this all start? Uh, it's pretty much been my whole life. I've been outside and, you know, really into the natural world. And, and from a young age, I, I think I had a, a really acute awareness that our modern life was just kind of out of whack somehow, out of balance, and I always mm -hmm. sought to understand, okay, how did people do it up until – modern times you know when before the industrial revolution you know how did people get it done it seemed like we tend to overcomplicate life and and they got by well enough you know and, and like in, in the survival circles in modern times it's it's largely about the equipment people fixate on that and uh you know i appreciate a good tool as much as the next person but you get some people they get too wrapped around the axle about what knife you're carrying or whatever and uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have to remember our ancestors did this with a broken rock. Mm -hmm. You know, they just took a piece of a broken rock and, and they lived with it. So it's it's not so much about the material as it is about the mindset and about the skill set, you know, actually knowing how to uh, make do with what you've got at hand. Yeah, it's crazy how, you know, every time we create some really – awesome you know piece of technology like the internet or electricity or something like that that um <clears throat> that becomes a, a main part of all of our lives and as soon as that were to go out um like 
people would die, uh, society would fall apart in a lot of ways. You know, imagine if the electricity just went out. Yeah, it would be a lot of people would die. Chaos. There would be so yeah, many we, dead people. Yeah, we see that even in short term outages. If yeah. it were a pro, if it were a prolonged and sustained outage, uh, you know, everything we have is pretty much tied to the grid in one way or another. And and so I think having some some alternate ways. You know, just sources of heat, having a backup plan of how you're going to stay warm, how you're going to cook your food, how are you going to access and make your water suitable to drink, you know. And sanitation is is often overlooked, and it's not really sexy to talk about. Everybody wants to talk about what type of knife you have or guns or something. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. But, Let's you talk, know, sanitation, food. yeah, that's the deal. <laughs> Long term. Nobody, mm-hmm. Nobody's willing to, to get down and dirty and talk about shit. In survival situations, That's right. let's talk about it right now. Why not? Let's talk about let's it. Break some ground. Well, yeah, I, so you, I think we should bury it. That's my. I vote for that. Let's bury it. <laughs> that's it. That's all. That's all. Just we gotta just bury it. That's simple. Yeah. All right. Just bury it's your that shit. Simple. Bury your shit, people. Yeah. yeah bury it. <laughs> so the the show we got to watch a couple episodes. I need clarification on the location so it, British Columbia right and it was at Quatsino is that how you say that yes ma'am that's correct it was uh, Quatsino Inlet and, and that is the name of the First Nations people that live there they call them collectively uh, the Quatsino though actually it's I think my understanding is there are a lot of small tribes that make up that area and, and I think the whites tend to just lump them into one category and, and call it all one people when in fact it's a lot of smaller uh, groups they actually we did get to meet the indigenous people they 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 were so beautiful and welcoming to us they did a, a ceremony where they did all of their dances told us all of their history uh, wow. we got to hear that their language spoke and wow. they uh, got to meet all their children and they did wow. uh, this this big uh, feast for us. It was amazing of all the food wow. that they that they eat, and uh, we spent some time with them and got to learn a lot about them. Uh, and we had to do also some archaeological classes so that we would understand uh, if we were to come across something of archaeological significance that we would not, through ignorance, damage that site in any way. And yeah. it was pretty eye opening to learn all of that. And so we actually were in their reserve land. It's land that has not been cut for timber. They they don't do anything with it. Uh, I was on a, kind of an old village site. There were some burial grounds that I think some of the other participants uh, were placed near. And so okay. you know they they actually sent some archaeological study groups in there to check the areas out before they allowed us to go in to make sure that they would catalog things and uh, instructed us that should we find anything, A, don't mess it up or even touch it, and mm-hmm. B, you know, kind of mark it using the GPS device so that they could later come back and make sure that that's preserved. So, you know, we were really careful not to damage yeah. anything while we were there. Are, are they pretty uh, secluded out there? I mean, how much contact have they had with, you know, white men? Oh, they're they're a, they're a modern people. They they engage in commercial fishing, logging, things like that. Uh, but one one thing I thought was really beautiful about the experience is that they do keep their traditions and their their histories alive, and they they're passing those on. Like what we were talking about, you know, in, at the beginning of this conversation, how we were not passing on a lot of this knowledge, mm-hmm. and but they're still doing that. They're they're telling their children, hey, this is our language, and this is our culture, and this is how we lived on this land all this time, and then they're keeping those things alive, and that was really good to see that. Wow. That had to be, had to, had to been quite an experience. It, it was. They were, they were very welcoming to us, and uh, a very resilient people, and, and, you know, after spending time on their land, uh, I was grateful, you know, firstly, that they gave me the opportunity that they invited and welcomed us and gave us their blessing to be there, but also... Uh, you know, after having lived out there on the land, I realized how how strong they had to be as a people and how resourceful. Oh, I bet. Yeah, it, it was amazing. Yeah the the what were the elements like? What what was the time of the the season when when we they were actually doing the filming? Well, they dropped us off in October, and so we were there basically in the winter. And Jeez. and that was one thing that when we did tell the people 
uh, what we were there to do. They, they actually laughed out loud. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, this time of year? <laughs> they said, there's nothing wow. for you out there. You know, basically, there's, and for to have, that was kind of, that, that was, uh, it was sobering, you know, when, when the native people look at you and, and laugh hey. and say, oh, that's, uh, hmm, you're going now. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. So really? that was my, that was my first clue that I was in for it, you know, that it was going to be a, a pretty austere trip. In, no, there's, it's, it's like less than a hundred people, right? In the, in the tribe or so. Uh, oh no, I don't, I don't know their numbers. Um, and, and I don't think we met everybody, but it, they were probably, I'd say close to a hundred people just stirring around that night in the, in that central area. So. Okay. I'd say they're they're much more in that area. Okay. And that was before or after you had I'm that that was before, right? Before you Yes, had, it was before, right. Okay. Yeah, we we got the send off and and all of that. So it was like a couple of days before we we physically went out into the field. They they had us over and in an evening and we went through some uh, ceremonies and things with them. And I mean, what's going through your mind when you got dropped off? Well, uh, initially, you know, as we're flying in, I, we all went in through different insertion methods. We had helicopters, we had float planes, we had boats, and I guess it, it was dependent on the topography around your site and also the distance uh, from the area we launched would would dictate what method they used. Uh, I went in via helicopter. The reason for that is my site was the furthest out, and at high tide, there was basically nowhere to to put a helicopter. So they took me in at low tide and, and put a helicopter down right on the edge, I guess mm. for time's sake, because it takes quite a while to get out there by boat. And we drew our sites randomly. Uh, one of the medics, we had some uh, medics and on-site survival "Quote unquote experts," which he he was an expert uh, from the UK, and uh, he had made some homemade fortune cookies and put numbers inside the fortune cookies, and <laughs> nice. so we drew our our fortune cookies at random, and whatever number was in there was your corresponding site on right. the map where you would be dropped, and uh, I I happened to get the one that was I think the furthest out to sea, uh, away from the just- port itself. How did you guys decide who got to draw first? They that that was not our decision. That was something that the production crew did, and I would imagine that they tried to orchestrate it in such a way because you had planes and helicopters and boats all going at the same time. They tried to time it so that everybody would hit the ground as close to the same time as possible. That was the sense that I had. Okay. Of it. okay. Cool. So you don't have somebody like, oh, I was out there an hour longer than this guy, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, right. they, they actually had contingencies for that. They had that factored in. Uh, they had a secondary helicopter that filmed my helicopter land, and from the time my foot hit the ground, my clock started. Okay. And so if it came down to that where we're splitting hairs and one guy was there, you know, 20 minutes longer or whatever, they, they actually knew how long you're there down to the minute. Well, it ended up being fairly close, didn't it? Well, I guess you know you were just the last one left. I mean, as soon as as soon as the second to last guy bowed out, they came in and got you, didn't they? Uh, almost instantly. There was a storm in the area, so I think I was out there another day or two before they could physically get to me. I was, um, I was saying a frenzy. Would that be that be kind of funny if they uh, after the sec- you're the last one left, but they don't tell you, and they just see how long you keep going. <laughs> yeah, that that would be pretty cruel. Yeah, that would violate yeah. your Tenth Amendment or Eighth Amendment rights. You know, for right? cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, but, that would not be cool. <laughs> and yeah, I think I read Sam was fifty five and you were fifty six, so like basically a day apart. So it wasn't something, right away. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, that is insane. Which I think, which I think days. is cool because you get to kind of just appreciate the fact that you were really alone. You know, you, think you got to spend a little bit of more time just all by yourself. Well, I was, you know, we're by ourselves the whole time because we're we're isolated from each other and we're filming it ourselves. So, I think that's oh, one thing about our show that that really um, 
sets it apart is that you have you the know, psychological isolation of there is no camera guy, there is no film crew, there's no producer. It's you with about 60 pounds of camera kit yeah. uh, and you're self-documenting the entire experience. So I love that. There, there's no communication with home. There's no update as to world events or what's going on with anything. Uh, we have the means to tap out via a satellite phone, and you also have a tracking device that you wear that has a little red button on there. You lift up this clear cap and depress and hold the red button for five seconds, and then that will scramble a medevac. You know, should you become injured or mauled by a cougar or something, you can, you can <laughs> scramble help that way. Yeah, so that I think that's badass the way that they do that, where you have to film everything. And it's just you out there by yourself because that seems like the most real, honest way to do it. If you're going to be, it is. It totally is. You know, yeah. Because then the psychological isolation is is real and it's a factor. Yeah. Um, and it's a huge factor. And you know, film and self documentation, it's like having a third job. You know, I mean, it keeps you really busy. It has to be a huge pain in the ass having to not only lug that around, but also you know, be uh, attentive to the fact that you need to film you know, pretty much everything you're doing. Yeah, that, and, you know, the, the filming was one of the people asked me what the hardest part was. Honestly, filming was one of the hardest things. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, it took up so much time. It took up so much energy. It was just one more thing you had to do and carry around. And by, by like, day three, I was ready to chunk that camera in the ocean. I was done. <laughs> I was over filming. But, I mean, you know, that was my whole – I understand the necessity for it because without it, then that's how you convey – your experience Mm -hmm. and so you have to film but it it was just there were times where it was really problematic Uh, really hard do they encourage you to try to be i mean somewhat entertaining when you're filming too or or at least you know like no instructive no there was they just basically said film yourself just film everything film as much as you can and that was that and i and i think that's what that's what resonates about the show is, you know, whatever you see, I'm certainly they get to, they get the final say, they get to edit what actually gets aired on television. Yeah. And, and for them, I would imagine that would be a hard job because we filmed constantly. And so you've got 10 people and then you've got one hour, you know, and you take away your uh, commercials. So you got like what, 40 minutes of airtime or whatever. And they've got to divvy it up and choose what footage ultimately makes the cut. So, yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, we just filmed as much as we could, and I think whatever comes out, it's just that's that's what that's what's going on. You know, the person's going through whatever they're going through, and it's, yeah. it's all uniquely individual. And, you know, I think the big takeaway, we always talk about the physical stuff like the shelter and the traps and what you do or what you don't do, but at the end of the day, it's about the psychology. It came down to the psychological aspects of survival and and it came down to caloric intake you know Mm -hmm. well you seemed um not only to be really the most entertaining of all the guys on the show um but you also seemed like you had your shit together you seemed the most together psychologically and just you know with your confidence you didn't seem rattled really at all yeah i didn't really feel i mean there was it was surreal when, when the helicopter drops you and they fly off and and that that whole rotor wash just goes away into silence again and the everything in the forest just returns to baseline you know you have that epiphany of wow i'm i'm really out here and i'm really alone and there's not another human for i don't know how long you know Mm -hmm. and for me one of the parts too that was challenging is i had never been to that area of the world nowhere even near it and so I had no experiential frame of reference as far as the plants, the animals, or any of that. And so, which was good because that made it a, a true test. You know, I took I took my survival strategy that I've always employed and that I've always taught to people, and I applied it in a foreign environment, and uh, and it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Um, so that that was nice, but I, I just uh, I was really out of my element. It took a couple of weeks to fully acclimate and and start to kind of dial in you just you you just seemed comfortable the whole time though well you've got to be you've got to be calm you've got to make yourself comfortable uh 
you know, but once defeat occurs in your mind, that's it. You're done. You know, once you're done mentally, you're done physically and in every other way. Yeah. Uh, and, and you just have to, you know, it's like I, I was training some soldiers today. Uh, I'm up in, here in Washington State, and one thing I, I was telling them is like the old adage, um, you know, how, how do you eat a cow? And it's one bite at a time. That's the answer. And it's the same way, you know, in a survival situation. You slow down. And you, you ask yourself, all right, what's, what's my most pressing concern right now? Like, what's going to kill me first? And then you check that box and you stay focused on that one task. You know, if, if, if what I need to be doing right now is boiling some water, then I'm just going to be, I'm going to boil that water. And I'm going to be yeah. totally, fully focused on that and just live in the present moment. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm going to do. And then once I've got that done, I'm going to say, all right, what's next? And and that helps that helps fight the anxiety. It helps fight the nervousness and all that. You start to take actions and improve your situation, and and then you don't focus on all of the things that potentially could go wrong. You don't you don't think about what could be. You deal with what is. You know. Yeah, that seems yeah. like the most popular um, thing. The most common phrase I hear from you know survival experts and i'm using air quotes for experts <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> is is the first thing they say is slow down yeah yeah well it's like they'll say in ration sweat not water you know be efficient with your expenditure of energy and uh you know think it through and and then uh take the appropriate action it's like the old uh, acronym stop you know s-t-o-p that stands for stop think observe and plan yeah uh, and by slowing down and doing things in a really targeted way, in a systematic way, uh, then you're, you're using your energy and your resources in the most efficient manner possible. And in a long term, you know, there's quite a disparity between a short term survival situation and a long term survival situation. You know, short term, it's, it's all about, you know, okay, don't freeze to death and deal with that, you know, your core temp and, uh, Make sure you get something to drink. Make sure you get some water in you and, and that, that sort of thing. And treat your injuries if you have any and don't do anything that's going to, you know, exacerbate an existing in- injury or cause one. And that's your short-term world. Now, after you've punched that ticket and you've made it through the short-term situation and now you're in a long-term situation, everything flips and it becomes 95% psychology and caloric intake, you know. At the end of the day, in, in, in the longer term, weeks and months, those types of situations, you know, it boils down to are you going to get enough to eat versus the calories that you're spending and then your psychology, you know, how's your mindset? Are you are you coping with everything? And, and that's something we don't touch on enough, I think. I think the two most overlooked aspects of survival or, or preparedness, actually, would be the psychological aspects. Uh, and and also your physical fitness. I think those are the two things that get overlooked, and we all focus on just the materials. Do I have enough beams? Do I have enough bullets or, or whatever? And it's, it's psychology is hugely important. Your sanitation is hugely important. Your physical condition is hugely important. You know, you're going to face a number of stressors out there, uh, including but not limited to uh, stress, anxiety, fear, Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, hunger, thirst, extreme cold, extreme heat, possible even physical pain. You know, you're going to face all of that. And in a given day, you may face, you know, most of those things at different times in that day. Uh, so it, it's hugely important that you can get your mind around that and have mechanisms to cope with that. And also, too, I think we, we kid ourselves from the physical standpoint you know, you see people put together these bug out bags that weigh seventy pounds, and yeah. uh, <laughs> they've never a they've never taken that bug out bag even for a walk. They don't know if they're physically capable of carrying it. Secondly, there's stuff probably in that bag that's still in the wrapper, and that they don't even know how to use. They don't even know if it works. And I'm speaking from the experience of doing survival assessments for people and and in the trainings that I've done with people looking through their existing kits these are common threads that I see that pop up over and over uh so keep your kit light and don't kid yourself you know you have a physical limit and you need to know what that is and if your physical condition is unsatisfactory I would encourage you to do something about that take a take a look at your diet take a look at your habits 
How can you improve that? Uh, start by getting out there and going for a walk. Do some stretching exercises. Uh, go for a jog if you're able to. And and then if, if you're able to challenge yourself further, go for a jog with your rucksack on your back. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because and, and here, here's my rule now. If I can't put my ruck on and jog for an hour nonstop, run with it, then I have no business carrying it. <laughs> and here's yeah. the thing, guys. You are not going to rise to the occasion, okay? We're, we have these... We have these preconceived notions that when it happens, we're just going to rise to the occasion. You're not. You're going to default to your lowest level of training, whatever that is. That's whatever you can. Well, that's just the truth. And so, you know, if if I can, if I do not on a regular basis put a rucksack on and run somewhere with a sense of urgency, I'm kidding myself to think that one day something's going to happen and I'm just going to throw that ruck on and all of a sudden I can sprint like Flojo with that ruck on. <laughs> Yeah. My, if my body is not accustomed to doing that and I suddenly ask my body to do that, it's going to result in injury or the inability to function, you know. Right. So mm-hmm. you've you got to be real with yourself in that regard. You, you said that you currently train soldiers? That That's currently what I'm doing uh, here. Uh, I was asked by a unit to come up and teach them survival and some tracking and some counter-tracking. Uh, and evasion type stuff, and so I'm I'm currently so uh, ar- doing that. Army soldiers. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I was I served six years in the army. I was military police, and uh, I don't think that the military has enough, you know, survival training, in my opinion. Right, and and you know they they will often bring in someone that has a, a specific skill set to kind of enhance what it is that they do and. And that's good. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And, and maybe, you know, maybe basic training and, and stuff has changed since I was in. I went to basic training back in 2001. And... Well, a lot of it's job specific, too, depending on what you're tasked with. You know, some some people have more of a pressing need for that type of skill set than others. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to to mission specific things like you know what what you're going to be tasked with and and that sort of thing kind and, of near, you know, narrowing it down more a little bit instead of just right. super broad <clears throat> right and i mean this in this particular unit it definitely has a need for that you know because they operate in very small numbers and things of that nature so mm-hmm. so have you been to washington had you been to washington state before this? I have I have not. This is my first time, and uh, okay. uh, it's beautiful land up here. I really like it. Very, it's similar in some ways to my time on the island. Really wet, lots yeah. of moss, <laughs> lots of <laughs> lots of, lots of evergreen trees. Yeah, uh, that's, so, yeah. I can imagine. You've cool. been. I mean, since you've been on the Alone Show, you've been pretty damn active in the whole survival scene. Well, you know, I've. I've been doing it for a number of years. I'd say probably past 20 years, you know, on and off among my other jobs. I've always taught in, in survival, but I guess once people see you do it on TV, it's like, oh, he, he does this. It just kind of puts you out there and gives you a platform or whatever. Right. Uh, but that's, so, that's great yeah. because, I mean, obviously you, you're somebody that somebody that anyone who doesn't have the kind of experience or training that you have, you're somebody that – that's going to learn some shit when, when they come to you, you know, you're obviously worthy. And, uh, so that's, that's awesome that you have that platform that is able to help you get, you know, your expertise out there and your training out there. Yeah. I, I joke around with people. I'm like, it just gives you street cred, you know, yeah, you like, Oh, you yeah. can actually do that. You know, you, <laughs> this one guy it was funny. He sent me, you know, I got, I got a lot of messages from, and I'm, I'm terrible with tech and I, there's a lot of them that I that just myth slip through the cracks. Cause see, I'm actually I actually live this way. I operate out of my rucksack a lot. That's basically my mobile office, and I'm in the woods a lot. I'm in places that don't have service, and and I'm I'm all thumbs when it comes to the uh, <laughs> the tech stuff. Anyway, you know. Yeah. yeah so that. so I, I don't get back to everybody, but this one guy he did send a message, and he said uh, he he said, Mister K, your man card can never be revoked. 
ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was it. that was his message yeah. based on that. I thought that was funny. I never thought of it that way, but yeah. I tell people about that mess. I get some some funny messages. People You're pretty definitely nervous. a card carrying badass, and you you proved that fifty six days in the winter. Up in, but the uh, thing is, you know, we really we all are. It's not. I'm not doing anything that I'm not reinventing the wheel here. You know, our ancestors. They all did it. No matter where you're from, you know, if you're from China or if you're if you're from Africa, if you're from America, you know, our ancestors, you trace it all back, there's that commonality that we all chipped rocks and made them into stone tools. We all did fire by friction. We made cordage from plant fibers and we trapped and ate animals and we built shelters so that we wouldn't freeze to death. And and that's something we all have in common. This is just reconnecting with what it is to be a human on the earth. Yeah, uh, and they, they used to be common skills, and now people look at you like you're a ninja, like this is some esoteric well, kind of with, thing. But it's, it's just yeah. it's well, common, you know. It's, yeah, it's but, reverted. It's reverted. But it, yeah. but I mean, because of how society is now, and and with technology and everything, it's just that much more impressive when there's somebody like you around that that can do something like that. Because not a lot of people can do that. You know, they they just they aren't willing or they don't have the knowledge or experience. So when you see that, it's like, oh shit, that's a badass dude. Yeah, but I mean, really, too. You know, if it, if it were that great, we'd still be doing it, right? I mean, if stone tools were that awesome, we we would not be carrying these fine metal hatchets that we have nowadays. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's in our nature to constantly be trying to improve and invent. It is. And- and it, you can see it with, with primitive technology, you know. Mm-hmm. Probably the oldest thing was maybe like a, a rock that was sharp. We used that. And then somebody said, you know what, I need a better weapon, so I'm going to use this long stick so he can't get close to me with that rock. Yeah. And then some guy said, hey, I know. We'll take a rock and we'll put it on the end of the stick. Yeah. And we'll an put it on an even, even longer <laughs> stick. Another uh-huh. guy said, hey, let's take a stick and a string and use a smaller, more aerodynamic stick, and we'll actually launch it from several feet away. And it's just been tit for tat, back and forth like that. One thing leads to the next thing, and uh, yeah, when you here gotta, we are. When you got to fight tigers and shit every day, you can't just stick with the sharp rock. Eventually, yeah, you, you that's gotta, right. You got to either <laughs> evolve or uh, go away. <laughs> that's know? right. You know, and that's a really strong point. And and I, I think that if hunter-gatherers lived the way that we live, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. And uh, we, we definitely spend more energy than we produce or than, than we take in. So looking at it through the lens of a hunter-gatherer existence, you know, if, oh, yeah. if our life patterns, they're just not sustainable. You know, they're just not. No, I agree. It's All of this is going to come crashing down at some point. It may be, you know, hundreds of, years from now thousands of years from now nobody knows but at some point it can't last forever i don't see how it possibly could no i can't yeah, well it seems and, pretty fragile yeah yeah i just think i think about like how you know back then or whenever even now when people live a minimalistic life for back then when that was the only choice that you had it's just it's still based on a need versus a want and now it's more people base their decisions on things that they want or they think that they need them but it's really not they don't need them you know so that i feel like that's the big the big difference the the kind of weird change in thought i don't know yeah that's a really good point you know uh being able to separate and discern want from need i think uh if you look back in our country in the 19 turn like turn of the century 1920 certainly the 1930s you know people lived a really austere life during the depression uh yeah they absolutely would separate want from need and that stark contrast is one of the epiphanies that i had coming back from my time on the island you know um for instance i would make fish traps out of uh, little bottles that washed up and then I was every day I ate from those those fish traps. I had like six of them going out there, and every day they had little fish and eels and things in them. And I'd pour them up and make soup. Yeah. And then and I come I I come home and I see bag a bag of trash every day generated in a household, and I see uh, those same plastic bottles that basically fed me and and sustained my life. Yeah. I see them discarded on the side of the road. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's we're we're kind of out of balance. Mm-hmm. 
you were yeah. you're, you're saying frenzy something about uh um a pot uh how how alan wished he had a pot <laughs> well i don't know if, i don't know if he had a pot or not but Did you? i read that you had said that the number one thing better than a yes. knife to have is a pot because that, can, that's correct. Yeah, it's harder I to did find. have a pot. Uh, okay. I did. I, yeah, I did have one, and that and that is a statement that is true. Uh, metal just container just made you appreciate the pot a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that you know, a metal container is one of the hardest things to improvise in nature. You know, what else out there exists that you could place on a fire, put water in it, put food in it, and boil it up, and it doesn't uh, yeah. burn up in the fire? You know, mm-hmm. so. There are primitive methods that you could use. You could do stone boiling, and you could sure you could make a clay pot and all this other stuff, but horribly labor intensive, and you know not as not as strong as a pot, not as portable as a metal pot. So that's it's one of the things we have several metal pots in our kitchen, and we we take it for granted until you go live out in the woods, and then you realize, wow, I can't make one of these. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Just little things like that, being able to turn a knob and fresh, clean water comes pouring out. That's that's not the case out there in the woods. You've got to go find it, then you have to boil it or filter it to make it safe to drink. And mm-hmm. you're you're. Uh, I think that's the thing is you're so old, intimately involved with every aspect of life. Nothing yeah. just happens. You have to go make it happen. You have to go make your water happen. You have to look your food in the eye, kill it with your own hands clean it cook it consume it and uh there's with with that comes a reverence and uh an appreciation that i don't think we get when we uh get our meat from under the cellophane wrapping in the store you know mm-hmm. yeah we used Absolutely. to have to if, if you wanted to eat you used to have to go out and kill something or grow something harvest something to eat now we just go to the store and throw some money down on a table and and we get a slab of meat to bring home there's absolutely no effort involved. Yeah, exactly. and half and half the time, I, I mean, I personally, when I go grocery shopping, I feel like half the time I'm not eating everything that I buy, and I waste it. Like it's horrible. You don't even see the where that meat came from. You don't even see the actual animal at any point. It's just, it's all no. Done. It's you don't even associate it with an animal. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's That's eating un- unknown food and then usually not even eating all of it. And I feel like the waste thing is is prevalent too, where you're just there's so much waste. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I bet you really get to know yourself out there. Fifty six. Oh yeah, days. that that process happened. That's one of the one of the biggest parts of it is um, all of the the mask that we wear, all of the the self delusion that we engage in, and. Uh, all of the distractions, you know, with our devices and our electronics and television and radio and smartphones, you take all of that away and then, you know, there's nothing to distract you from your stuff, you know, and we've yeah. all got it. We've all got our stuff. We've all got our little demons and things. And so you got to do business with all that. And, and that, I think, is what gets most people is that process. Uh, if they haven't worked through all of that or made peace with it, and find themselves unable to, then that can that could be one of those psychological factors. So after the second, what Sam was his name? Sam Larson, the one. Sam who, Larson. Yeah, that kid. That he was. What was he like? Twenty two years old. Something like that. And and I'll go ahead and plug for him anyway. He's awesome, and he has just written a book. I think the name of which is "To Tread in Wild Places," and uh, yeah, I recommend. I mean, if if he wrote it, it's got to be good. That that dude's hardcore. Yeah, I was cool. very yeah. impressed with him. I guarantee Frenzy is looking it up right now. Yeah, Tread in Wild Places by Sam Larson, yep. right? Yep. So we have to get that. That's one. that's mm-hmm. got to go on the bookshelf. It, it's on my list of things I'm going to get yeah. for my reading list. Yeah, just definitely. made our list. Absolutely. When are you going to write a book, Alan? I'm actually in the process, and it's it's going slower. Like I say, I'm in the woods a lot, and it's and when I say write a book, I mean I'm writing it old school. You know, I got the quill and the ink, and I'm dipping what? it. What? No, and, you're not. Uh, no, Are you I'm, I'm, I'm using a number two <laughs> pencil and a spiral bound notebook. That's Perfect. that's the truth. That's yeah, I mean, it's a number two pencil. You know, so I'm literally writing it. I'm not typing it or anything, and wow. it's it's a slow that's process awesome. and. A lot of people are telling me, dude, you're you're missing your window of opportunity. You have 18 months after exposure on TV to get your book out. And I'm like, eh, whatever. 
<laughs> but whatever. No, people are going to buy that book. I don't care if it's three years from now. People will buy that book. It, yeah. It's not just about survival. I, you know, it's going to be, obviously, I'm going to tell the story of my time there on the island and, and the story behind how I got there and all of that. And there, well, there will be survival takeaway. You know, I want the reader to be able to come away with some with some knowledge around survival, but also, you know, touch on some of the things like we've talked about, some of the awarenesses uh, that that you have on the tail end of it and maybe some of the life lessons and things like that. Mm-hmm. So it will yeah. be multifaceted, you know, if and when I ever get it completed. <laughs> You should just have you it. Will. Pub- you should have it published, just like that, in your own handwriting. On like, have it have <laughs> yeah. it be a, a hardcover book, but the inside just looks like notebook paper, and your just handwriting. Photocopied. Yeah. Photocopied notebook paper. <laughs> yeah, cool. I could I could see me showing up at one of those places, like what do they call like Kinkos, where you show up and say, yeah. guys, I like uh, I'd like half a million copies of this, please, on college ruled notebook paper." <laughs> Do you have recyclable paper, too? We'd like that. That's yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I like it. Uh, so what was it like when when they came? Did they did they just show up, or did they call you on the on the sat phone when, when you were the last guy, when you officially won? Well, they, they made contact with me. Uh, we had a, a device where they could send a, a short text message on it. Uh, it was also our tracking device. It was a thing called a yellow brick. It works off the Iridium network of satellites. And okay. they sent a message that, uh, that told me to be by my camp around mid-morning that they were coming for a med check oh. and, to shoot some, and to shoot some aerial photography of my site. And they said, so be handy for that. And I was like, where am I? Where else am I going to be? Have you seen the weather? You know? Like, no, I so got, I sat I back, some yeah, okay. Do. You know, that was my response. <laughs> there was like some pre-selected menu of things you could say. And I just pushed the okay selection so that they would know I received the message. And, and so that was that. They showed up the next morning for the med check. But in actuality, they showed up to take oh, me out of there. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. What did they say? They, just, they came up, you won? It's no, good. it wasn't that quick. They uh, they had me read some lines, and they were talking and stalling and killing time. And <laughs> I was wanting to go down because it was low tide and the weather broke. I was trying to go down and get some seaweed eat or something, you know. Yeah. And uh, then they uh, then they informed me, yeah, you're you're the last one. Holy <laughs> shit! What'd you think, man? What went through your head? I I just at first it was just a shock because in my mind I, I thought. I thought there were, you know, four or five, maybe even six contestants still out there. I didn't know. Yeah. And so it was kind of a shock, but uh, but I, I was I was I was happy to go though. Yeah, let's roll. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Mission accomplished. Let's go to Sizzler. You know. Right. Did, uh, did they feed? Did you? Uh, did you kind of have to ease into eating normal food again when you first got back, or did you just go? Do yeah, you, you can't eat a lot. You know, I just I kind of just ate constantly. Like I would eat little bits and take a break, and then come back and eat a little bit. You know, and uh, it was like that for a while, and then I I got back into the swing of things. And then what was the first? What was the first thing that you were like? I can't wait to go home and eat that. It, it was peanut butter, is what I created. Yeah, you know? that's awesome. And and German chocolate cakes, which people were sending those left and right because I mentioned it, you know. So after the show aired, I started getting German chocolate cakes. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And the the German chocolate cake thing got out of hand there for a while. I was I was eating them as fast as they could bring them, you know. Do you get too bad you didn't uh, you couldn't land like a German chocolate cake sponsor or something and get a bunch of free cakes for life. Yeah. Yeah, I probably don't need that because I don't have the discipline. I would eat them all. Yeah, well, so. so now you just have to start uh, one of those one of those workout videos. You know, the the yeah. the uh, the alone fitness you know program because you lost like what did you lose like sixty seventy pounds out there? Sixty pounds, yeah, yeah. Wow. And you level out after a while, you know, people think, well, you were just slowly dying. You, you hit a spot where your body goes through ketosis, you know, if, you, if you're if you used to eating carbs and all that. Yeah. And, yeah, it has to learn how to run on protein and fat, and that's all. You know, I'm eating fish and so seaweed funny. every day. You're so. just slowly dying. Yeah. yeah. 
But you do. You level out. Would, that's, yeah. If I were to do that, that's what my mom would say. You're you're just dying. You're so skinny. Yeah. Okay, mom. I've been eating kale and minnows for the last month and a half. Mm-hmm. Did you did you kind of get to like eating the seaweed? Like it was kind of like a little snacky kind of thing. I mean, that was one of the yeah, first I was things just, that you found, right? Sure seemed like you yeah, enjoyed I'm, it. I've never been a a, pen, a finicky eater at all, so I was just proud to have something to eat in whatever yeah, form. That's you awesome. know, I've, and to this day, it, I'm I'm that way. I'll eat whatever, you know, as yeah, long as had, I get something to eat. You had uh, like you you had a real um, relationship with the limpets, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah the, the limpets became this metaphor for life out there. I studied them, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> They were, they were something else. There's this, can I, Frenzy, can I play this, this thing of, of Alan talking about limpets? Sure. Hold, let me see if I can, if this will play. It's, it's like your philosophy on limpets. They made a whole thing of it. Yeah, they, they've got it on YouTube, the, the limpet philosophy. It's, it's, uh, it's a video more, on there. Can you hear it? You have to check it out. Can you guys hear this? It couldn't get better. Oh, it did. It's really quiet. Oh, it got chin deep and better. There's limpets for days, baby. I'm here forever. And so this long is, as there's limpets. This is on the island, right? Limpets. Limpets. Yeah, yeah that's I actual believe. footage from the show. Feel it. He's the comet. He's like getting spiritual with the limpets. Breathe it in. <laughs> I am the limpet. You are the limpet. Nothing wrong with that. I am the limpet. I am the limpet. Was a that, philosopher wanted to study. Was the that limpet. one of your uh, I think, one of your big sources of of food out there, or or is it mostly catching the fish? Uh, yeah, the, the limpets were a were a staple in my diet. I mean, I certainly I ate a lot of fish. I ate a lot of crabs. Uh, I had a duck. I ate um, you know slugs and the inner bark of hemlock trees and. Uh, the the small minnows and eels, lots of seaweed of different varieties, some mussels. So I mean, you know, there was a a good cross section to my diet, but but the limpets were kind of a staple. The limpets and the seaweed called bladderwrack. I think some people call it rockweed. It's a brownish mm-hmm. kind of seaweed that has some air air pockets in it, uh, which I really liked. It had a nice texture. But at any given day on low tide, I could go down there. And I could get some limpets, and I could get some bladder rack. And so that's something from the plant kingdom and something from the animal kingdom. And it was really empowering that that was, that was my staple. And so, yeah, I had a reverence for the limpet, you know, because I could, I could eat those when I couldn't eat anything else, provided I had access to them, you know, if it's low tide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you get, um, you get to develop a real personal relationship with your food when, when, uh, when you're in a situation like that, I bet. Yes, yeah, very much so. So, I mean, for, so food-wise, you were you were okay. You weren't really in any real dire straits when it came to food. Oh, it, times were lean, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I was I was living. But I mean, it's the winter. By that time, the First Nations people would have already smoked up a winter's worth of salmon, and and they eat those reserves, you know. But that's a community working together to achieve that. You know, when yeah. you're by yourself, it's it's pretty tough. When, when you're isolated, uh, you know, they'll say an alone wolf is a dead wolf. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, you, you can, you can adapt and you can survive and you hang in there and then spring comes around and the berries come out and everything and you, you fatten back up. But besides, how like, was your, how was your fire situation? Were you yeah, able to make that. fires easily and often or it looked wet. Was it difficult to find stuff to burn? Yeah, I, I had a fire when I wanted them, uh, and I, I didn't keep them going because there again we're back to that expenditure of energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and firewood represents calories because you have to go process it, you know. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I, I would make a fire and boil water, cook whatever I was going to do, dry out clothes, warm my feet, that kind of thing, and then I would just let it die a natural death. I didn't feed that fire or keep it going. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, a huge tender preparation was the key up there, you know, really finding dry tender, preparing it and keeping that tender protected and, and staying ahead so that when, when the meter rose for a fire, I could just make one. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of work went into that as far as processing tender and processing firewood and in an area that receives annual rainfall somewhere in the neighborhood, like 14 feet. You know, yeah, that's it's, insane. That's crazy amount of rain. Gosh, it, just, it looked like you dealt with a lot of moisture 
during that time. Yeah, it, it was like living in a car wash. Oh, I saw it. You know, just water everywhere. Nothing's ever dry, really. Yeah, it's not. Just various degrees of dampness. <laughs> you you had really moist, semi-moist, soaking wet, slightly damp, you know. Uh, yeah. I, I think you... if I could get a job anywhere, I'd want to be the weatherman for up there, you know. <laughs> Today you will receive six feet of rain followed by a blizzard, <laughs> and you'd never be wrong, you know. Yeah. Your accuracy level would be super high. You're not going to yep. want to commute today. You might as well stay inside your uh, hand-built shelter. Yeah. Uh, commute, That's right. Commute's looking pretty bad today. Conditions uh, are shit. What about uh, an- animal situations? Did you have any of those, like bear, mountain lion, anything like that? Yeah. Sweetie? Yeah, I had. Uh, didn't see any of the cougars. Uh, certainly they're there. They're just real stealthy. Yeah. Um, I had a bear that lived about 100 yards from where his den was to my shelter. So oh. we were neighbors and bumped into each other some going to water. I think we shared the same water hole. Yeah. And, but nothing, you know, nothing uh, threatening or anything like that. It was all peaceful encounters. And then there were some wolves came around uh, my third night on the island, but they were just kind of checking out to see who moved in the neighborhood and didn't feel threatened about that. They were just scratching and sniffing around, and then once they checked me out, they left. Yeah. It's interesting because the I feel like there's been instances where the animal encounter thing has caused like the fear in people, and that's what has caused, had caused yeah. them to go. One guy dipped out after one night. But Yeah, and you... I mean, if who knows what you do in those situations? I mean, right. if, I, yep. if I had, like I think one of the guys, one of the bears – kind of came at him, like too close for comfort type thing. Right. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try to wrestle a bear, you know. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I won't second guess anybody for, for that, you know. Uh, right. I just mean, like, did you have any previous experience with any of those animals before? And, you uh, know, just normal when you're camping well, or whatever? In, yeah, in, in the mountains that, that, I, that I'm from, we have quite a bit of black bear. And so... I'm pretty familiar with them. Now, the cougars were a new thing. Uh, I didn't know. That was really, if I had a concern about animals, that was my biggest concern. Yeah. It was me too. the cougar. Um, but the wolves and the bears didn't really bother me much. I just, you know, I have a respect for them, a healthy respect, and, and I try to be really disciplined about how I handle my food and all of that so I don't do anything that's going to ring the dinner bell, you know, and, and invite right. them in. Mm-hmm. Uh, that kind of stuff. You, I would freak out if I saw a grizzly bear. The cougars would, <laughs> yeah, the cougars would freak me out the most. We're, oh yeah, we live. We we broadcast out of Minnesota, and mm-hmm. and I go camping in the Black Hills every summer, every spring, and that's the one thing that's on my mind every time is cougars, mountain lions. One of the things just latching onto the back of my neck when I when I least expect it. Yeah, and and that's kind of how they do it, and and it'll be quick. Oh, yeah. yeah. Better than a bear. Bears just start eating you. They apparently they don't they don't kill you first. They just start eating. They pin you down and just well, they want to play with you. Just start you eating. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather I'd rather the cougar just take me out. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the way I I think about it when I've been in areas where there's cougars. It's like, you know, yeah, you're gonna die, but you're probably not gonna suffer. So that's good. I don't mind dying. Everybody's gonna die. I just don't want to suffer. So yeah. if I'm gonna go out, I, I want it to be quick like that. So well, yeah. Be, yeah. it'd be a badass headline, you know, to go out yeah. being mauled by a cougar or something. I don't know. I'd at least want to get one lick in, so you know they yeah. could say, right. "Yeah, he, there's blood on his knife, and we found this cougar with a laceration." Yeah, or they found they know, find and, both of your dead bodies. You took each other out. Yeah, cool. they find some hair laying around from the cougar, <laughs> at least something, you know. And speaking of mauled by a cougar, have you seen the YouTube video song Guy in a Buffalo? <laughs> I haven't have seen to, that. You, oh, you have hilarious. to look it up. It's, it's amazing. It's hilarious. Please. There's, I think there's two or three parts, but it's just if you type in Guy in a Buffalo, you'll find it, it's and I promise you, you'll appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, apparently there was some movie back in like the 60s or 70s called like guy on a buffalo or something 
and it was some guy who actually was tr- he he trained wild animals and had experience with them and it was and it was about this guy who like lived on the prairie out in the woods and and uh found a baby buffalo and trained it and then he would ride around the prairie on this buffalo like it was a horse <laughs> <laughs> and, some and this, man is like made a, a song. this is like a song yeah, yeah based on funny. it yeah <laughs> it's stupid humor but it is funny I promise you that. I'll check that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I think we're we're about at the time to wrap this up. Already. Yeah, unfortunately. Did you did you do um a word by our spo- of our sponsor? I didn't. We're just gonna have to plug it in at the end. <laughs> okay. All right. But we'll get it in there. Um. So, Alan, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure you've had a long day. Yeah, it's just been pretty active. You're, con- yeah. you're you're constantly working, aren't you? You're just running all over the place. Yeah, it doesn't feel like work, you know. I'm 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 doing what I'm passionate about, so yeah. it's, it's not like I'm bagging groceries or working in a sawmill or mm-hmm. both of which I have done in the past. So I speak <laughs> it, it makes yeah. a hell of a difference when you actually enjoy what you're doing. It does. Good for you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for being with us, um, and uh, you know, hope to have you on again sometime. Yeah, it'd be great. Call anytime. And uh, yeah, we we look forward to following more of of what you got going on. You you you're like you said, card carrying. You got the man card. They can't ever take it away from you. <laughs> and uh, you're 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 teaching people some uh, some very valuable shit. Very valuable. Yeah. That, it- it, I think that's one thing I enjoy about it is it does have substance to it, and we never know the full measure, you know, of what we do. So maybe, maybe somewhere down the line, it will it'll help somebody, uh, you know, maybe maybe even save their bacon. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, extremely valuable skills that I think everyone should have some kind of basic basic knowledge of, you know. So keep spreading that word, man. Keep spreading it, and. Uh, and reach as many people as possible because there's too many people out there who don't know how to take care of themselves. Yeah, and in fact, <laughs> let's let's plug Sam's book one more time. It's called "To Tread in Wild Places: An Introductory Guide to Wilderness Living Skills" by Sam Larson. You can find it at, on Amazon.com. Awesome. Check that out. Yeah. I'm buying it tonight. Yeah, definitely. Where uh, where can people find you, Alan? Uh, honestly, the best way to get a hold of me is just call me. Um, or you can send me a message on Facebook. My public Facebook K page is Alan K, A L A N K A Y alone. Uh, and I put some posts on there from time to time that are informative or whatever, and I try to post some stuff here and there. Uh, or my cell phone number, which I just give out freely because I get it's it's a global number. Everybody knows it. They've got it in different corners of the earth. It's seven zero six nine nine four three four zero five okay and uh i pretty much travel all over and teach uh, survival preparedness uh self-defense personal protection combatives that type stuff so i've got kind of not just survival i've got a a wider uh, swath of things that i teach yeah you've got self-defense and everything that you've got uh, a lot of experience in that you teach and you've Mm -hmm. you've got a, a youtube channel too correct well, I, I've never done it. There's stuff that has appeared on YouTube that, like, people have been around while I'm doing something, and they film it, and they'll put it on there. I don't know how to make that happen, but oh, I do okay. have some things on YouTube, yes. There's a there's a channel, the Alan K. Survival, and it's got a yeah, bunch of Yeah, a buddy of mine, yeah, he did that, and, and he put stuff up there. And I do, I'm not tech-savvy enough to make that happen. I don't know how to <laughs> but make there, it live. But there is a lot of videos on there of you of you teaching different different aspects of survival and, and things like that. Yeah, most of those are classes, and somebody, you know, mm-hmm. has, has asked, can we film while you do this and put it up? I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, and then you're, pro- you're not on Twitter, I, I am. I, people have opened oh. a page for me of like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not on Twitter. I know Donald <laughs> Trump's on Twitter, but I, I'm on Instagram, Okay. and uh, I, I don't know how to get on it, but I ha- I'm, I'm going to learn. I pro- <laughs> One day, I promise, I'm going to sit down and learn all of this stuff, And but it, it can be so time-consuming, though, know. you know? Yeah. Uh, it's super it, time-consuming. Oh, it's crazy, and so when you're out in the field, you're actually living this lifestyle, 
and, and you're trying to live a more simple and basic existence, you're not around the technology, it's kind of hard to keep up with it. But, but I do try my best. It's like a whole uh, other I, skill set. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, do you have a, a website, though. Yeah, uh, alankcurvival.com, and it's I had that set up, and I haven't done a lot as far as posting classes with it because a lot of my stuff has just been word of mouth and, and repeat people once they they do one training with me, then they, they book two or three other types of things, and uh, eventually, I'm going to try to get organized enough where I actually put a calendar out there and plan ahead a little bit so okay. people could have some notice of what's going on. But I normally will post on my my Facebook page uh, things that are going on, too. So yeah. I try to keep people abreast of training opportunities uh, that way. Yeah, I bet, you if Very you put cool. a, I bet you if you put a calendar out there, you'd get plenty of people that would love to train with you. Yeah, I'm actually, the one thing coming up I'm going to be doing is the Prepper Con. I think it's going to be in Salt Lake City, Utah. Oh, okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, going to gonna be there. Um, Nicole Apellian from Season 2, she's going to be there as well. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. So if you're in the Salt Lake uh, City area for Prepper Con, come by, give me a holler. Yeah. I'll be teaching some classes there and doing some Q&A and that type of thing. Awesome. Nice. And that's April 21st this year, coming up. Okay. April 21st, April 22nd. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. don't plan anything for then. Alan. All right. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah, it's it's on the calendar. I have to consult the calendar. <laughs> and and it's also on paper with a number two pencil. I don't, yes. I don't know how to use this one in the phone. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> this one in the phone. I love it. Yeah. We're going to have, uh, uh, we're gonna have uh, Mike Lowe on next month. Yeah, he's he's a super skilled guy. I tell you, that guy's crafty. Yeah, it's unfortunate he, can, he got sick. Yeah, you know, I'd love to be partnered with somebody like him because I have the exact opposite approach. I'm super lazy, and so if they were to team me up with that guy, you know, he could just build all this really crafty stuff, and I would just kind of he's pretty high hang speed, out. Huh? And yeah, he's good to go. That's awesome. <laughs> cool well that's where uh those are all the places you can find uh alan and follow his uh all his expertise because he's got a lot of it that's for sure yeah very cool all right well alan we won't take up any more of your time go out and uh get back into the woods you're probably people don't realize that alan's actually been doing this whole uh podcast from a cave this, this last hour, he's been in a cave, like in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in an undisclosed subterranean location. location. <laughs> <laughs> he made his phone that he's talking to us on right now out of sticks and rocks and things. <laughs> yep. Well, this is what he does. It's another day in the life of Alan K. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you. You bet, buddy. Take care. Holler you. Thank you. Okay. That was our guest, Alan K. Mr. Alan K. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, really, really good guy. <clears throat> Got a lot of respect for that man. Mm-hmm. Um, card carrying badass. Forever. Man card for life. Yep. <laughs> for life. Um. So yeah, that was great. Um. We you can find Alan. Um. He he's not real. He's not real big into the technology. Yeah. Um, so, but he he gave out his phone number there. It's on Instagram. It's he's on Instagram. He's on Facebook. Facebook. If you want to reach the guy and 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 talk to him about you know survival or or self defense or you know any of the many skills that he has, um, Facebook or the phone number is probably the best way to reach him. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he's doing things. He's doing some good things. Mm-hmm. Um, tomorrow, we have uh, Emerson. Am I saying is it Strivesen? Strivesen. I think Strivesen. Strivesen? I think Strivesen. it's Strivesen. Comedian, Emerson Strivesen, and mm-hmm. he'll correct us if I pronounce it wrong. Oh, he'll probably <laughs> correct you right uh, He's going to be with, He's going to be our guest tomorrow night, um, so check that out. And uh, you can find the Sarge Approved Podcast all over the place. Where are we, Frenzy? Where can you find us? Um, we are on Twitter, at Sarge Approved. We are on Instagram, Sarge Approved. Facebook, Spreaker, iTunes. Mm, what YouTube? else? YouTube. Um, SoundCloud, SoundCloud, Audio Mac. Words. Return. I mean, just of type the in Mac. Sarge Approved. You're gonna find us. Um, like us on Facebook. Like our page. Mm-hmm. Go do it right now. Right we'll, the second. We'll wait. We'll wait. Okay. <laughs> Did you do it? Okay. okay. Awesome. Um, follow us and on Twitter. And uh, yeah, 
we've got some we've had some awesome guests and we're gonna have some awesome ones coming up Mm -hmm. uh february is all booked up and march is already almost booked up so look forward to that um and go check out national survival center go do it right now um because like alan k says you need to be prepared it's not about uh if the zombies show up even though they are coming yeah it's coming Alan, alan doesn't think they're coming but they're coming people um, but until they do show up, you should still be prepared. And you can get all the things that you need to be prepared uh, at National Survival Center. They've got pretty much everything under the sun. Mm-hmm. Go check them out. It's at nationalsurvivalcenter.com or survive or suffer, don't come. Yeah. Survive, don't suffer. Don't do That's it. It's like their whole motto. Yeah. And it's a damn good one. Mm-hmm. So go check it out. Uh, we're going to play out this episode. Am I missing anything? Am I forgetting anything, Frenzy? No, nope, you're good. All right. We're going to play out this episode with a song by Jeremy Wallace, and it's called Broke and Hungry. Boom. Boom. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Bye. Later, fuckers.
Hey, this is Frenzy here to talk to you about National Survival Center. This is the place where you can purchase all of your outdoor camping gear and supplies, survival kits, disaster preparedness supplies, bug out bags, and even survival food. All with some of the lowest prices on the internet and free shipping on almost everything. You can depend on National Survival Center to provide you with the highest quality gear paired with superior customer service. And when you purchase your gear from National Survival Center, you're not only getting a great product, but you're receiving products that have all been hand tested to ensure that they'll be reliable, durable, and that they'll function properly. So whether you need some gear for a family camping adventure or maybe you want to stock up for the zombie apocalypse, National Survival Center can provide you with the quality products you're looking for. You can find them at www.nationalsurvivalcenter.com or www.survivedontsuffer.com. Either way, don't suffer, make sure you survive.